We'll be in 1 Kings chapter 12 in just a few moments. When you begin a new leadership position, you need to ask yourself, what does this institution need? What does this organization need in the way of leadership? Because how you begin is how you're going to need to continue. You can't change your leadership style in midstream and it be acceptable or people understand it. If you decide this organization needs a firm hand, you have to start with a firm hand and you have to keep a firm hand. If you decide, on the other hand, that this organization doesn't need a firm hand, what this organization needs is someone to give a little bit of direction, a pat on the back, and things will go smoothly. And however you start is however you have to end. And you have to decide very soon, does this organization need a house cleaning, or does this organization just need a little encouragement? Because how you begin is how you have to continue. You can't begin with an open door policy and then decide two years later, I think I'm gonna close my door. People won't understand that. Nor can you begin with a policy of generosity and then change to a policy of frugality. People won't understand that. How you begin is how you have to continue. I've read three books on leaders by Walter Isaacson. And I don't know if it's Walter's writing style or the people who he writes about. But about 20% through the book, I can't stand that person. I've read three of them. I've read his book on Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin had that famous saying, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. The man who said that and wrote that and took credit for that saying should not be allowed to sleep until noon. I, I have no use for Ben Franklin because his character was inconsistent with his public statements. The second one I read by Walter Isaacson was Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was a mess. His family life was a mess. His personal life was corrupt, and the way he treated his children was absolutely horrendous. He and his wife divorced when the children were young, and he would write to them letters arranging for them during school break that I will meet you at such and such a vacation or a resort. I will meet you on this date. We'll spend Christmas together, and then you can go home, and I will come back here. And then Einstein just wouldn't show up. He wouldn't tell his children, I'm not going to make it. He wouldn't give them a reason. He, the children would show up, and he wouldn't show up. I just, just, oh. But the one that got my goat the worst was Steve Jobs. It took all I had to finish the book about Steve Jobs. He's rude. He's disrespectful. He's irate. He's irrational, but he sure was successful. Changed the world. Changed the way we communicate. Changed music. Changed photography. We're told that Apple's going to change TV, and it may not be long before they change the way we drive. But his... The way he treated his employees, if you didn't have his vision or you didn't make his vision come to fruition quickly enough, your life could be miserable. And there were people who were faithful to the company who maybe didn't perform as well later on as they did in the beginning, completely cut them out of the stock options. But you can't argue with his results. He seems to have gotten things done. How you begin in leadership is how you have to continue. Now, in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 12, we are looking at a transition in leadership, beginning in the first verse. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And when Jeroboam, son of Naboth, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon. And then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy, 
Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us and we'll serve you. And he said to them, being Rehoboam, go away for three days and then come again. So the people went away. And then King Rehoboam took counsel with the older men who had attended his father, Solomon, while he was still alive, saying, how do you advise me to answer this people? And they said, if you'll be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them, then you, when you answer to them, then they'll be your servants forever. But he disregarded the advice that the older men gave and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him and now attended him. And he said to them, What do you advise we answer these people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that, our fa- that your father put on us? And the young man who had grown up with him said to him, Thus you should say to this people who spoke to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you must lighten it for us. Thus you should say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Now whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I'll discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had said, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people harshly, He disregarded the advice that the older men had given him and spoke to them according to the advice of the young men. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. Your father disciplined with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people because it was the turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shinoanite to Jeroboam, son of Naboth. When all Israel saw that the king would not listen to them, the people answered the king, What share do we have with David? We have no inheritance with the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, O David. So Israel went away to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah. Two weeks ago, we discussed as David came to power that there was a civil war taking place in the country between the north and the south. And the south won with David's military might. And then Solomon held it together with his building and with his infrastructure. And now here we are 80 years later. And Solomon's son has traveled north to Shechem to try and gain the blessing of the leaders of the north who still hold to these tribal divisions. Shechem is one of those places that stands out in Israelite history. Abraham passed by Shechem on his way to the Oak of Mora. It was at Shechem that Joseph's brothers, in their jealousy, buried him in a pit and then later sold him to the slave traders who carried him into Egypt. It was at Shechem where Joshua gathered the people together after the promised land had been conquered and he said to them, Here is what the Lord has done for us. And he recounted the exodus and he recounted the blessings of coming into the land. And then he said, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That that was at Shechem. And over these years, Shechem had kind of become the second leading city of the nation behind Jerusalem. And Shechem was a place where the people of the north went to worship and they went to offer sacrifices because after all, they're 41 miles north of the city of Jerusalem. And so it makes perfect sense that Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, comes to the north to get the blessing of the tribal leaders that he shall be the king. And they call for Jeroboam. Jeroboam was a man recognized for his leadership by Solomon, and Solomon put him in charge of the construction of a wall in Jerusalem and over thousands of laborers. And one day, while he's wearing a brand new suit of clothes, Jeroboam is walking back home, and the prophet Ahiah stops him in the robe and takes his new coat off of him and tears it into 12 strips and lays them out in the road. And he says to Jeroboam, Thus saith the Lord... 
Solomon has worshipped other gods. He has worshipped the gods of other nations. He has worshipped the gods of the Moabites and the Ammonites. And he has worshipped the gods of the Egyptians. Therefore, I am going to give you, says the Lord, ten tribes. And he picked up ten strips of new clothing out of the road. And he gave them to Jeroboam. And he said, you will reign over these ten tribes And I will let Judah have the city of David in the south, and they can always have the memory of what David was. Well, when Solomon heard that prophecy, he jumped up and chased Jeroboam out of town and ran him off into Egypt, where he has stayed in exile until Solomon's death, but now here he's back. Here he's back as a spokesman for the tribes of the north, and they say to him, your dad just about killed us. Your dad worked us too hard. His demands were too much. We built too many roads. We built too many fortresses. We built too many temples. We have done too much. Just loosen our load and we'll love you forever. And so Solomon stepped away. Stepped away. I mean, Rehoboam stepped away from the people for three days. And he asked the older ones, what do you think I ought to do? And the people who had advised his father said, the people are right. Your father's worked them too hard. Just ease their load and they'll love you forever. So he listened to that advice and then he called in all of his peers and he said to them, what do you think I ought to do? And he said, I think you ought to take charge and let these people know who the boss is. You tell them, I think my father was bad. My father's waist weighs less than my pinky. The things are about to get this heavy around here. So he weighs the two opinions for three days. Go easy, go hard. And he called the people together and he said to them, My father beat you with whips. I'm going to beat you with whips that sting like scorpions. You think my father put a hard load on you? I'm going to put a harder load on you. And the people sat back and they said to themselves, We're not going to do it. What do we have in the city of David? And they stepped away and they shouted to your tents, old Israel. And they went away and they abandoned Rehoboam. And the country's divided into the north and the south. Now when David was king, the south won. When Rehoboam's king, the north wins. And the north takes their ten tribes and all of their labor and all their workforce. And they anoint Jeroboam as king. And they send Rehoboam back to Jerusalem to reign over the little pocket of the country that's left. Now, as I've read to you from Scripture, and as I've retold the story to you now, you get the impression that this is really a generational issue. This is an issue between wise older people and not so wise younger people. This is an issue between people who know how to collaborate in their older years and people who want to take charge in their younger years. I'm not sure if that really applies. I'm not sure that this is really a generational issue. Because when you look around at the leadership theories that are around us today, those that are proposed by younger people for the most part, you don't find that take charge attitude. Zappos is an internet company that sells shoes and clothing. I never bought anything from them, but I've read about them. Last summer, their CEO declared that they were no longer going to have any managers or any bosses. They were going to manage the company in a theory called holacracy. H-O-L-A-C-R-A-C-Y. Holacracy. Every employee would decide what they want to do best and what they like to do best, and they'll do those things And they'll make their own way and their own path. And everyone around them will do what they want to do and what they want to do is best. And so Zappos Shoes is being managed with a theory that every employee does what they want to do in the way they want to do it in the time frame they want to do it. And he's 30 years old, the gentleman who's put this in place. Dan Price is the CEO of Gravity Incorporated. They take credit card payments and they're based in Seattle and he began looking at the demographics of his company 
And he figured out that in the Seattle, the best living wage is $70,000 a year. And early last summer, he declared that every employee that works for Gravity Incorporated is going to make a minimum of $70,000 a year. And the people went nuts. One guy said, if we can finally start a family. Another employee said, I can afford to fly with my mom from Puerto Rico to visit me here in Seattle. And so they initiated the plan that over the next three years, they're going to build everybody up until the entry-level position at Gravity Incorporated is $70,000. Now, before you think that it's all younger people wanting that, I want to tell you about Jim Tollefson. Jim spent 14 months in Iraq and 12 months in Afghanistan. He's jumped out of an airplane 26 times. He's received three medals of commendation for value. And he says enough is enough is enough of this trying to build collaboration, let everybody do what they want to do. Jim says at 27 years of age, what we really need is people with the right information to stand up and say, this is what we're going to do. And he said, I don't care if you have to stand on the table, jump up and down, and scream it in the boardroom. This is what we're going to do, and we're taking charge. And he's 27. So we have one 30-year-old who's running his company by everyone is their own boss and does what they want to do. Another 40-year-old CEO who says everybody's going to make the same amount of money and we're going to start at a very high level. And then you've got Jim who says no matter what you need to do, jump up on the table and get everybody's attention. So what's right? If you're Rehoboam, do you listen to the people? Or do you think to yourself, if we give them an inch, they'll want a mile. If I ease up on this, the next thing we know we'll be easing up on this, and then we'll ease up on this, and pretty soon productivity will just stop. Or do I need to take charge and let them know I'm the boss? What do you do? A few minutes ago, Rhonda read from Mark chapter 10. Prior to the verses she read, Two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, have come up to him, and they said to him, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, let one of us sit on your right hand and one of us sit on your left hand. Can you do that? Let us, let us be in charge right beside you when we come into the kingdom. And the other disciples heard what they said to Jesus, and they became angry, as you would expect. What do you mean? I'm going to be the one on the right. No, I'm going to be the one on the left. What do those guys think they are asking for this privilege? So they began to stew and they began to argue amongst themselves. And that's where Jesus offered those words. If you want to be the greatest, be servant of all. For the servant, Son of God gave himself as a ransom for many. Jesus' message comes not with complete grace, but with an idea that I came to die for those who were sinners. And those who I came to die for, and those that I love for, and those that I've given a sacrifice for, are sinners who are in need of a Savior. And he is not saying in this, I came to serve everybody so everybody can do what they want to do. No, I came to serve those who are sinners. And in my coming to serve those who are sinners, they recognize who they are, and they come and they follow me. The sacrifice of Christ is an acknowledgement that you and I can't save ourselves and God has agreed to serve as our sacrifice on our behalf. Last Sunday morning, I was feeling fine. But my doctor and my wife were mean to me. And they made me stay home, alone on a Sunday morning. I didn't know what to do. I went down in the basement, turned on the TV, and watched uh, the interview with the new speaker of the house. I was listening when he said, it's broken. Hmm. The fact that the new speaker would admit that I thought was pretty bold. He said, we don't have an agenda. Pretty bold. But then the moderator said, stay with us. Most of you will stay with us, but some of you will be leaving. 
Well, I didn't know, but I was one of those who would be leaving. And they put on a church service from the hippest church in Lubbock. And I try to keep up with them. And so I said, you know, I haven't watched any of their stuff like this. So I watched it. And the sermon message was on acts of service. And the preacher began to define what an act of service was. And he says, an act of service is something you don't want to do. But somebody else appreciates. Somebody else appreciates. And he went through all the things that he does for his wife and his kids that he doesn't want to do. But they appreciate it. And then he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. And he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to wash their feet, but nobody else was doing it. So Jesus decided he had to do it. It was an act of service and he didn't want to do it, but he did it. And then he told a highly inappropriate story about an act of service that he did for his wife. And at the end of the story, the moral of the story was, guys, do this act of service. It'll pay off for you. Terrible story. I sat there on the couch when it was over, and I thought, man, I'd like to get a hold of this guy in preaching class. But then I began to think... How many of us think of service as that way? How many of us think of service as the thing we don't want to do, but somebody else appreciates? Jesus said, if you want to be in my kingdom, you'll be servant of all. And I do think Jesus washed the disciples' feet because he loved them, not because nobody else did the job. I've told you stories of E.A. Day before. E.A. Day was a deacon when I was at First Baptist Church Matador and 26 years old. The intersections of where he was in his life and where I was beginning to pastor a new church came together at a perfect moment. My very first Sunday in Matador in March 1989. I had arrived at the church a little before seven. I had gone around the building and unlocked every door, top and bottom. I had set every thermostat I could find. And I was in my office about 7.15 when there was a knock on the door. And it was EA Day. And he said, don't take my job away. He said, I can't preach. It's my job to unlock this building, set the thermostats, and make the coffee. It's your job to preach. You let me do my job, I'll let you do your job. And he was gone. So the next Sunday when it came time, I unlocked the door to get in near my office, then I locked it back. And I locked myself in the building. He came through. He said, hi, it was our ritual that we would visit for a few moments on Sunday morning as he passed through. EA cooked men's breakfast one Saturday a month solo by himself. Never asked for any help. Just provided it to the men of the community. EA filled the Lord's Supper cups. On my very first Lord's Supper, when I was supposed to preside, EA leaned over as the deacons were gathering and said, if you'll just stand here, we'll show you how to do this. And I was never relieved to hear anything in my life because I didn't know what to do. And he showed me how to do it. But on Saturday, you'd find EA filling the cups and putting them in the refrigerator and then setting the table on Sunday mornings. And one Sunday morning, a Palm Sunday, we were having the Lord's Supper. I don't know where everybody came from, but we had 30 or 40 more people than we normally do. And I sat in my place during the song service and I thought to myself, we don't have enough cups. We, We don't have enough cups to serve the Lord's Supper. 
And so during my sermon, I stood over the Lord's Supper cups, preaching my sermon and praying at the same time that the Lord would multiply those cups as he did the loaves and the fishes. And we had no more trays there than when I began. And we began to prepare for the Lord's Supper. EA Day came over and leaned, in my, leaned into my ear and said, there's another tray full of cups sitting on the table in that hallway. Go get it. He had washed the coffee pot after Sunday school and he had come up into the sanctuary and he saw the crowd, counted noses, went back downstairs into the basement, filled another tray of Lord's Supper cups and he saved the day. And he and I were the only two that knew it. Opening the building, setting the thermostats, making the coffee, feeding the men, the Lord's Supper cups, and a few other things. Nothing but acts of service. But I wonder if you could ask yourself, if there was ever an issue that came up in the church, who did the people look to for wisdom? He didn't have, quote, a position. He wasn't in charge. He wasn't the king. But by his acts of service, he was the leader. EA died a few years ago. Spent the last couple of his years of his life with Alzheimer's care. But those acts of service are still living in me. And they're still living in that church. And his influence is still felt. Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, you be the servant of all. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story of Scripture. that reminds us of the importance of those who lead us, of their attitudes, of their examples, of the challenges. Father, every one of us who stood in Rehoboam's shoes would face the same decision, and we might not make the right answer either. Lord, help us to be wise when leadership choices must be made. But Father, more than that, help us to be the servants who do the little things that bless others so that the gospel might be preached with clarity and with love and so that the world might know your love. Father, Help us to be the greatest by being true and genuine servants. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is Take My Life, Lead Me, Lord. It is a plea to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and let it take care of everything in our lives. I invite you this morning to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. He loved you and gave himself for you. Some of you are looking for a church home. Come and join with us as we seek to be servants in this place. If you have a need in your life, I'll be here. Let's stand. Let's respond as the Spirit leads this morning.